It's your girl Missy here back with another one here to discuss Raising Canaan Season 2, Episode 2, Mind Your Business. We start off with Rock and Detective Howard meeting. The conversation was very predictable. Howard wants Canaan to know that he's his father, and when Raquel tries to deny that, he knows for a fact because, of course, he had Canaan's blood tested last season. He also tells her that there is a snitch in her crew, Scrappy. He tells her that Scrappy is working with the police. He saw him sitting with a detective at the precinct. Rock is like, ain't no way. But Detective Howard also left off the fact that his mother was there with him as well. Detective Howard is going to use what he can to his advantage. This was intentional. He knew exactly what he was doing. Kanan goes to Famous' house and Famous is in the bed with a chick. He don't even know the girl's name. So his mother, Miss Fig, comes home and she is pissed that he got a chick in her house and money is missing out of her purse and she think he took it to get drugs. So Famous needs to chill. Throughout this whole episode, people were mentioning that his smoking is becoming too much. Lou, Jessica, his mother, sometimes you got to realize the problem is you. Is Famous going to have a drug issue? Is that going to be his downfall? The next scene with Marva in therapy had me cracking up. When discussing what their triggers are, Marvin states that he had none, and he proceeded to get into it with Gerald, another one of the guys in the class. But Gerald did kind of pop off and say that Marvin wouldn't be there if he didn't have any triggers. And my whole thing is this, Gerald should have stayed in his place. Nobody was talking to you. You don't run this class, so you be quiet. Marvin had me cracking up. I personally thought he handled it well, but did y'all see the look that he gave Gerald? I'm like, woo, I hope he don't see Gerald on the streets because it's over for him. Who do y'all think was tripping in this instance, Marvin, Gerald, or both? So Juke goes to Rock and asks her if she remembers her mother. And Rock tells Juke that Kenya was a good singer and she is the one who gave Juke her gift. And then she goes on to explain that sometimes as a mother, bringing a child into the world is a lot of responsibility. Rock doesn't know the exact reason she left, but it could have possibly been that she felt like she was not cut out to be a mother and Rock respects it. And of course, Juke is like, nah, I can't respect that. And she has every right to feel that way because she was the child on the receiving end. So how are you not, how do you feel like you're not cut out for the position when you had a whole child? At that point, you got to do what you got to do. I love the relationship between Rock and Juke. Miss Bingham is still trying to pin her daughter's murder on Jukebox. She's adamant that Juke is the one who provided the drugs that killed Nicole. The Binghams are acquainted with the mayor and he had someone with them to observe the proceedings when they were at the precinct. Miss Bingham wants Burke fired. She feels like her daughter's blood is on Burke's hands. So although the captain spoke up for her, he's upset too. He's looking out for the department, but he feel like Burke messed this up. Where do you all think they're going with this storyline? Burke may be getting into some trouble. Rock, Marvin, and Lou have a conversation about Scrappy being at the precinct. Lou is saying that it wasn't Scrappy. There is no way that Scrappy is a snitch. Scrappy straight bled for them and lost the whole eye. So how is someone who has been down for them and gone through all of that all of a sudden a snitch? It makes no sense. So Rock tells Marvin to talk to Scrappy and see what Scrappy has to say. Rorwell comes in and Rock tells him that the activity he has going on is bringing the police and that's bad for business. Unique's business is dead. Dean is not going to sell to him. The end result for Rorwell would be him starving. So it's best for him to go ahead and switch sides now. So the deal is that he'll be working under Lou at the 40s. This is a hot mess. Like Rorwell of all people, According to the clip that we saw of Worrell in the trailer, it looks like he's going to flop back to Unique's side. But Worrell may be another body drop in this season. So since Famous got put out, it's time to hustle. So he asked Kanan to help him sell mixtapes. They go to Lou. Lou already wrote it off. So he tells Famous that the money he makes, he can keep it. But he needs to stop smoking. If he could come up with some new flows and put some on paper, Lou will get him back in the studio. This sounds like a reasonable deal. 
give Lou that work and he got you. Famous needs to get to work, get some hustle about himself, and leave them drugs alone. The way they setting it up, it looked like that boy is about to be strung out. Raquel is having rat issues at the bodega. So she tells Juliana to put some traps down and throw out what is eaten. The rats is straight up there eating the money. That is some crazy stuff. So Juliana is like, I'm gonna have to change these 10 times a day. Rock is not trying to hear it. She gives her an order to put the traps down and call an exterminator. When Rock walks out of the bodega, she sees Unique's baby mama, Pernesta. They look each other in the face without saying a word, but honey, you could tell that Nessa was spooked. Marvin goes to see Scrappy and wants to know why he could not get a hold of him last night. And Scrappy lies. He claims that he was helping his people out in Corona hang stuff on the walls which of course we know was a lie. And then Scrappy immediately switches the subject and says that they should have called Worrell to help them. That's when Scrappy goes in. That boy is pissed. He's been down with them since he was 14. He's been hustling and doing everything they asked him to do. His issue is that he was passed over and for Worrell of all people. The person that is responsible for him having one eye, that's kind of jacked up. But Marvin gives him another opportunity to tell the truth. He asked him, who was he hanging pics for? And Scrappy lied again and said his cousin Ebony. So that's three ways he messed up. This was Scrappy's chance to tell the truth. Listen, if somebody asks you a question and they're pressing you about it, and they ask you twice, pretty much the same question, but maybe in a different way, they know something. Tell the truth. Come on now, Scrappy been in the streets. How do you not know this? The man asked you, why could he not get a hold of you? Then he asked who you were hanging pictures of. He knows something ain't right in the buttermilk, dude. Rock is meeting with a realtor and the offer is a four bedroom house, three bathrooms in Hollis. So Rock asks her about more pricier neighborhoods and the agent is treating her a certain way because she's black and tells her that the homes are pricier and you have to have strong credit, proof of income, last two years tax returns to get a pre-approval from a mortgage lender. Rock is like, look, I'm paying cash and I got all of that. Make sure you find me something in a pricier neighborhood. I'm really interested to see where this is going to go. In season one, my hopes was that we got to see them elevate, move into a better neighborhood. So I'm excited about this. So Marvin goes to see Cousin Ebony and pay her a visit. He claims that he was the handyman working and wanted to know if she needed some work done. Ebony said not only does she not talk to her neighbors or cousins, the last thing she hung was a thriller poster in 1982. So of course Marvin then knows Scrappy Story is not checking out. But these people sure do a lot of talking because if I was Ebony, I wouldn't have told him none of that. Crown and Lou are at odds over Ziza. Lou feels like she's the next best thing and will change the game, and Crown ain't trying to hear it at all. Of course, Lou has the trump card because he is financing the business. In comes Cartier Duns Faree. Cartier is that guy. His money was so clean that you could eat off of it. So basically, Cartier has a small music management group. Ziza is one of his artists. She's basically the cream of the crop when it comes to the talent that he has. But he does not think that they can give her a deal that she deserves. But since he knows Lou, he proposes a single deal to develop, produce, and release a track for her. So this is supposed to be a win-win solution for all sides. And if all goes well, which it won't, they will sign to the label as long as certain thresholds are clear. Basically, long as that album pushes and they come out that bag. I thought it was interesting when Duns mentioned that he knew Crown's people, Hector. And Crown quickly stated, you know, that Hector had nothing to do with this, but I wonder if Hector's going to come into play later. Famous and Kanan are selling the mixtapes, so the police walk up on them and throw the mixtapes out. They're supposed to have a vendor's license to sell the tapes, but since they're not selling much anyway, the cops let them go. So there goes the mixtape plan. Marvin's attorney tracked down Tony, and she is now engaged to be married to a dentist in Westchester. So Marvin may be taking care of Tony real soon. She did get him into this mess, so that's another body that we may see. 
But I'm interested to see if something else is going to happen with Tony. Burke tells Juke that her mother lives in Harlem. She moved back two years ago from L.A. She's been divorced twice. She doesn't have any kids. And she gives Juke the address. So Jukebox leaves, but Burke tells her that she owes her. And you best believe Burke will be coming to collect and expect something in return. We see how we're talking to the detectives and he still claims that he knows nothing about that night. The blood on Unique did not match Unique or Howard. Plus, they have Unique on camera at McDonald's drive through during the time of the shooting. They do have a crackhead that was high. He remembers seeing a kid, but of course, they cannot get him to give a description. How much longer do y'all think Detective Howard will be with us? Because my prediction with this storyline is that they're going to get this Detective Howard thing wrapped up soon because in a minute, we're going to have to switch focus to the Italians. Rock tells Kanan that Detective Howard is talking crazy and he may step to him talking mess. So Rock claims that she was trying to just give him a heads up. Rock is trying to cover her bases and plant doubt in Kanan's head in the event that Howard says something to Kanan about being his father. Kanan is scared. Rock told him that Howard didn't remember nothing. So he's scared to know like, dang, this dude straight remembers what happened. Unique has been staying with Nessa and her mother. Her mother is not happy because she said that Unique could stay for a night, but not longer than that. She is trying to tell Nessa that she needs a father that can provide, that works, and take care of their kids. Not somebody who's just sitting around, eating up food, just taking up space. Here's my whole thing. This, I feel like this lady is wrong. I totally get where she's coming from, but folks will kick you when you are down. It was all good when he was paying her rent, buying her cars, sending her and her church friends to AC. And now all of a sudden that he's down, it's a problem. But Nessa tells Unique that she saw Rock at the bodega. Unique is most likely going to use this information to his advantage and use it to rob Rock at the bodega. She gonna know exactly who did it because she looked Nessa right in the face. Marvin tells Rock and Lou that he tracked Scrappy's cousin and it does not sound like Scrappy was there hanging up anything. Lou feels like Marvin isn't sure and if they are not sure then they should not make a move. Lou does not like their plan, but Rock is putting down the pressure. If Scrappy was at that precinct, then they could lose everything. He could put them all away forever. Unique goes to see Dean at Bingo, and he offers Dean 30% once he is back on top. He feels like he's going to win, but he just needs an assist. Dean tells him that he is not a safe investment. He is a person of interest for the shooting of a cop, and there is a lot of heat on him. Unique says, look, dude, I did not shoot that cop. That's why I'm walking free right now. But besides that, Rock and her Colombian supplier, they got the market on lock. They have Unique's old territory on lock, so there is no room for competition. Unique, of course, leaves pissed, cursing, flipping tables over. I'm like, ooh, this is a hot-ass mess. Jessica tells Lou that Crown got her a job and she's moving to LA. Lou is not feeling it at all, but to be honest, their relationship been over. They're always arguing. The relationship is dead. Jessica feels like she has to look out for herself. And I'm not mad at Jessica. You can't depend on Lou to look out for you. You got to look out for yourself. So if that job in LA is it, I say take it. Shoot. But Jessica is wrong for sleeping with Crown. Juke finally goes to see her mother's house. She sees her come outside and get into the car. There's no interaction at this point, but I cannot wait for them to actually talk. Hopefully we learn more family secrets, but in the trailer we see her mother slapping Marvin, so this is going to get very interesting. Unique goes to his old spot and everything is a disaster. He starts cleaning up and in comes Worrell. He tells Worrell that he needs him back on his team. Worrell is like, whoa, dude, I'm on to bigger and better things. I got a different opportunity. I cannot rock with you. That's when Unique realizes that he is messing with rock. People switch up on you quick, don't they? And Worrell tells him it's time for him to move on. The South Side is not for him anymore. And Unique tells him, can't nobody force him off the blocks. Not the police, not rock, not him, nobody. My prediction is that Unique is going to start working with the Italians and then he's going to be back on real soon. 
Lou, Marvin, and Scrappy heads to what Scrappy thinks is the new spot. The looks on Lou and Marvin's face is very sad. Scrappy is very happy. He's talking about how the spot is going to put out that good work and, and yeah, this is going to be it. This is the perfect spot. I'm like, Scrappy, read the room, dude. Read the room. Marvin's face, Lou's face, their whole demeanor is telling you something. Hick up on it. Like, like, what kind of street dude is this? Like, come on now. Their whole demeanor was off and you're not reading anything because you're too excited. They head to the spot and Scrappy is doing the absolute most. He just didn't see the signs that their mood, both of their moods was completely off. Rock puts a gun to Scrappy head. Scrappy realizes what's going on and he's like, no, 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 man. I felt so bad. That's when Rock shoots Scrappy. That boy hit the floor and I was like, wow, this somebody who straight been down with Rock. This scene was so sad. I hated to see Scrappy go. I feel like his mom was the CI and I just don't feel like it was Scrappy. He was loyal. But unfortunately, he made many mistakes. Rock told him to stop going to his mother's card game. Had he not went to that card game, he would have never got arrested and been in that precinct. Scrappy's death to me is on him. And then not only that, he continues to lie. So, but anyway, we're going to break that down in another video. That is my recap. So what were the highlights of the show? What did you like? Did you think it was pretty good? Or what do you think about Scrappy and what happened? This is a rough one. Down since he was 14, y'all. All right. See you later. Woo.